And the whole PR thing for our family control now is actually erasing our memories of what our ancestors shed their blood for. So I'm really excited to be talking today more about the death of Queen Elizabeth II. And I mean, I will say excited on some level. I don't want to be excited about somebody dying, but I'm definitely not a fan of the British crown. I'm not a fan of the British monarchy, so can't say I'm too sad about it either. I'm really excited to talk about that and the long legacy of colonialism, British colonialism around the globe, in Asia particularly, and of course in China, and what people across China think about it today, and a little bit about you know the U.S. thoughts on, on Queen Elizabeth and on colonialism. Colonialism too. There, there's so much we want to get into. So I'm really excited to be joined today by Zephyr, who's a YouTube influencer, creator, social media commentator. Really happy to have you on the show, Zephyr. There's so much to talk about. Hey, Rachel. Hi, guys. I'm Zephyr. I finished my college in the U.S. and going back to China. Um, I've been extensively organized uh, Asian lives Stop Asian Hate and uh, participated in BOM, this kind of um, human rights movement. And today we're going to talk about uh, Queen Elizabeth II. I think the topic is very interesting that uh, people throughout the world are, are willing to experience themselves. So let's talk. Yeah, no, there's definitely so much to get into. It's really interesting about the stop Asian hate. I, I think there's that's a whole other conversation for another day. It's it's pretty cool that as an international student, you got involved in movements when you were here in the United States. I think that's its own unique perspective to get into. But I, I really want to kind of open here with asking more uh, about what people in China think about the death of Queen Elizabeth. I mean, there's probably many different ideas, many different thoughts, many different camps of thought. But I, I'd love to know more about if people are really mourning over her, if people are, are really sad that she's died, or if people are reflecting in a bigger way on colonialism and the colonial history of China? Well, Rachel, it's a very interesting question, because when we're talking about Chinese social platforms, we have various social platforms and uh, we have various opinions. It's a huge population, but uh, generally dividing on uh, geographically uh, speaking, HK, Hong Kong and uh, Macau and uh, China mainland and Taiwan is very distinct from each other. So from my perspective at mainlander, then the major perspective is from the anti-colonialism. And for Hong Kongers, possibly some are mourning Queen because they think Queen is a very good symbol for her dedication working this long time and only representative for stability in this unstable world, uh, especially for those uh, pandemic thing. And for Macau, that recalls people of the colonialism from the Portuguese. And for Taiwan, people opinion varies depending on their political understanding, but not just Chinese, um, also the Koreans. I found a very interesting in Korean article that scholars are arguing how the Japanese colonialism comparing to the British is different and uh, cause a lot of turbulence on Korean social media. So when we're thinking about the pathway of Queen, then the colonial, and if we're not gonna talk about colonial, only about her dedication work, then it's interesting to me that uh, even though the Pan-Asia area has been colonized by Western world for so long time, then the reaction on their country leader now is so different. So I think it's good time for us to talk about why. Just looking in, I, I would assume there'd be a lot more, especially young people who have a, a very strong anti-colonial view and really recognize just kind of the atrocities that, that the queen is responsible for. In the U.S., we, we really don't have that kind of mindset. I mean, the U.S. does have an anti-colonial history. The U.S. was founded on an anti-colonial revolution, and it was a conservative revolution. I mean, we still had slavery in the United States, obviously. So by no means was it some progressive fight. But in China, the, the difference 
is the Chinese revolution was was led by poor people, was led by people who were fighting back against colonialism, fighting back against a variety of issues. In addition to that, of course, fighting for an independent China on so many different levels and, and fighting for poor and working people. So I was always assuming in some ways that there, there might be an opinion in China that would be a little bit more staunchly anti-Queen. I mean, is there at least a small minority of people that are anti-Queen? I, I'm curious to hear about that. Let's say the public opinion is like 40 think Queen is somehow an icon for instability and 40 is anti-colonialism in mainland China. But in other places like uh, Hong Kong um, and Macau, a lot of anti-colonialism and Taiwan, that a lot of uh, young people are moaning queen for her cuteness, for their admiration for a royal man family. They think by saying that possibly in their um, French socialism, we call in China, that is somehow um, possibly aims this when they talk to their friends and show their daily experiencing, then it's somehow a superior representation if they mourn the queen some way. So somehow means I keep an eye on what royal family did. And I love queen so much because she did one, two, three, four, five. She loves dogs. So she obviously protect animals, etc. So protecting, you know, dogs or cats can somehow defend in a way that uh, diluting people's interest in learning about the colonial history on their ancestors. So that thing I found is very dangerous and is very important, but always neglected now, yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely very dangerous. I, I think it's really interesting to me because you have a direct history. As a Chinese person, you have a direct history, a direct legacy of being colonized by the British. And in the U.S., we really never learn about it. We are taught in the U.S. that essentially all of the textbooks say that China was actually never colonized. So it's interesting to bring up Macau. Like it's, it's really interesting to bring up Macau and all these things because that's something that we're never really taught about in the United States. During our history classes, for the most part, we're taught something called open door policy that that even though China's colonized, it's not exactly colonized, not the same as the rest of the world, because I, I guess being open door, it means that there's a, a free flow of connection. So it's kind of interesting to draw those connections and see how they relate to the Chinese example as well, because in the U.S., we, we really don't learn about it. So I'm, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about that British rule in Hong Kong and what people need to know, because I really feel like there's a such a long history there that, that people in the U.S. and people around the globe are really just haven't heard of. Okay, very interesting. So under Qing Dynasty ruling, Hong Kong was barely just a fishing village, right? And the British came, they found Hong Kong is a great place for doing business. So they asked Qing Dynasty if Hong Kong could be self-governed territories for the British. Then they bring for a lot of Hong Kongers development in a way. So there is business, there is order, there is foreigners, and there is money, better life qualities. For that 50-something years, Hong Kong, I think, comparing to mainland China at that time under feudal monarchy, right, is a representative representation for a better life and future, including the pioneer for whole Chinese um, democratic revolution, Sun Yat-sen. He went to Hong Kong and wrote... The street is so tidy and people are laughing. There's order here. There's development here. There's future for China here. Otherwise, there's just muddy road and barely nothing. People just fish there. In a way, he thinks bringing development, neglecting whatever political ideology or being second or even fourth class citizens at least bring people better lives. So that's what happened before throughout the world, in um, Ireland, in India, the Great Famine, and Hong Kongers being re living under a repressive law system that when the British, for example, kill someone, then there is a sentence system. And for Hong Kongers kill someone, it's another. Then people start to recognize and realize under this system, there is no justice. And this is no good for their children. It's actually self-limiting itself from um, reproducing more development motivations. 
So at that time, people started to think, comparing to other political systems or other people living throughout the world, is our system better? Is this people treating us like people? Do we have respect? Do our children will have better life than I do? So that's when the question raised.、Um, interestingly, because I think this has to do something with the social media monopoly that the younger people do not recognize what's happening before, and those elders they feel ashamed to tell their. You know, kids like what happened before because they want to keep a very vivid or at least warm talking atmosphere. They want to avoid talking about that shameful history of being colonized or being not being treated not people. And other perspective is what I just said, comparing to Japanese colonization, the British seems at least little more civilized, not killing people, not treating people like animals. British are treating people like second-class citizens, right? At least people. So by comparison, there is a quote saying, "By comparison, people find happiness." <laughs> so possibly that's why, like, people feel it's、uh, tolerable comparing to what's happening just next to them in Guangdong Province. The Japanese are killing Chinese and making that into human experiments. Yada yada. One thing I find very interesting is uh, um, how they use branding. To recreate this fake atmosphere that people love the British royal family and love the Queen, so I think there is an article in Nature, two thousand twenty by Sichuan University, talking how the infiltration and creation by bots, social bots, can fake this facade that people love someone and use as a defense system to push something. People do not want to show the audience, right? So what they do is actually create this social group by using bots to say something not central, not not prioritized, but to talk more about the problem that is not major but minor. I mean, I feel like what you're saying about these social bots is is really interesting to talk about because obviously on social media, it, it's really such a big part of how marketing works. It's a big part of how PR works, and and the Queen is absolutely using a, a PR campaign. I mean, the royal family, I mean, is using a PR campaign to really be able to uplift their image. I think mainstream media here portrays the royal family like celebrities. I, I think there's a really big celebrity culture in the United States, and celebrity culture is. Really about opulence and wealth, and in so many ways, the royal family kind of fits right into that. And in the U.S., people were really started getting interested in the royal family around the time of Princess Diana. Princess Di was really to the average person in America like. They looked at her like she was a commoner amongst the royalty. It's a, like a common trope you'll find in like American pop culture about being the, the the poor person or the average person who gets either pulled into royalty or into riches. I mean, if you've ever seen the movie Pretty Woman, it's very like the movie Pretty Woman, where you go from nothing, you go from absolute zero to 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 wealth beyond your imagination. It's it's a very American concept, and so I think when people saw Princess Di, they really resonated with that idea, like you know. You know, she's she's like us. She can speak like us. She moves like us, and that's when I think a lot of the U.S. interest in the royal family kind of began. I think that the same thing goes for Meghan Markle today. A lot of people in America feel that way about Meghan Markle. Like she's so relatable, and they're moving to get away from the evil royal family that doesn't, you know, want them in the family anymore. There's kind of an interesting narrative around that about how they're moving to California or how they moved to California actually, and how the the people that are watching this and how they did their whole interview on Oprah that they're being persecuted, that they're victims of the royal family, which I kind of find just interesting when you really look at it on its face. There's Always this idea that there's somebody that we can root for. There's an underdog of the royal family, so to speak, that people in America want to root for. So that's a lot of public opinion of like really interested in these particular players in the royal family. But the overall kind of look at it, people in the United States view the royal family like they are this this. 
this celebrity in that way, in the same way that people view the Kardashians. <laughs> like there's this joke that the like, Kardashians are the royal family of the US. And in some ways it, it can be seen as true in the sense of that we are always inundated in the United States with riches, with wealth, with just opulence, with decadence. It's nonstop. I mean, that's the celebrity worship in the US. It's, I mean, people were literally giving Kylie Jenner money because they wanted to make her a billionaire. Like it makes no sense to me, but that's a, a big part of what people here just see all the time. This this worship of individuals in the form of celebrity. And I think the royal family kind of fit nicely into that and knew how to fit into that. They made a very conscious decision about how they wanted to portray themselves to the world. And so the, the idea that they're this family that has these internal dynamics, that kind of internal family drama, I think is really interesting to people in the United States. Well, Rich, one thing, what you said has to do something with the U.S. winner takes all cultural um, implementations in people's mind. I think they're interesting uh, related to the Wild West and adventurous and encourage people to find what's in the woods and wild. Uh, well, interestingly, I find it's uh, self-projection the same for some Chinese youth or lack of history knowledge that think possibly they want to be a Chinese royal family in a fantasy or fantasizing they're going back to 1920 something and marry a Japanese colonizer uh, or a British colonizer and go to British and have a very royal, very prosperous um, life, servants, caviars, you know, salmons and have slaves even. So that thing I found very interesting is how the New York Times actually carried out a column Opad from Harvard history professor that say monarchy is something we don't like. Remember America, where you come from. <laughs> I found it super interesting like how Harvard his, history professor, obviously she is not aware of the social platform power and why the, I think is almost a backslash from how you play around with, you know, social platform public opinion. And now it's so pro- queen that is against uh, what they think possibly just of America. Yeah. So uh, that one thing I found very, very interesting. And the second one is uh, the branding, the whole PR thing for royal family control now is actually erasing our memories of what our ancestors shed their blood for. I think the other thing that's really interesting here too is that we are like beat over the head since we're young with the idea that the that we should be against monarchy and that we're told all the time like relentlessly that dictatorships are evil and that China's a dictatorship or that Russia's a dictatorship. I mean anywhere that the US doesn't like they call it a dictatorship just hands down that's what they do. And it is kind of funny to me that that we call everybody the US calls everybody a, a dictatorship and yet they are convenient to look away from their allies who have actual monarchies. I mean, I thought, and I kind of feel like we're in the 21st century. I, I don't understand why such an archaic idea of monarchy is even even normalized on any level. It's it's not normal or acceptable for humanity anymore to have monarchs, to have kings and queens, to have wealthy people who are, I guess, divine by God to rule us. But in the case of the United States, they're willing to say, you know, and normalize and be okay with the fact that Saudi Arabia has, ha, has kings and princes. And they normalize that because that's an ally of the US. Or they normalize the fact that the British have a queen. And that it, it wasn't that long ago that the idea of, of the queen being the head of state of countries, it was a reality. I mean, in Jamaica, it was in April of this year when they actually petitioned for the queen to be able to, uh, to not be their official head of state, which is wild. In 2022, Queen Elizabeth II was still the official head of state of Jamaica. I mean, that's how recent colonialism is. The idea that it's gone is wild. And I mean, the U.S. itself as an empire, the, the, the new empire that replaced the British empire, I think we're, we're very primed to, to think that way and very primed to think about empire in a totally different way as if it was so long ago. And yet the U.S. still has a colony on Guam. The U.S. still colonized Puerto Rico. I mean, U.S. Samoa. I mean, you could go down the list and keep finding where the U.S has colonies and where the U.S. is ultimately a dictatorship. So I find that irony very, very frustrating, so to speak, as a progressive person in the United States. So that's kind of my thoughts a, a bit on uh, on the, the wide varieties of ways in which the royal family is portrayed here and, and the way that people think about it. 
that's very interesting. And this, uh, people think they could be lucky if they go back to uh, the colonial era. They will be some superiors or actually have an opportunity to be compradors. Is very interesting because if we use some stats now from, let's say, seventy fifty seven to ninety fifty, that's when India shook out and became a country that、uh, um, is very memorable. The biggest famine in India. Caused by Brit、uh, British colonizers, killed more than ten million Indians. That is not taught anywhere in UK history book. And for Ireland, well, judging on racial capitalism, they're whiter than Brit than Indians than African peoples. But the Great Famine in Ireland in Irish is called Angordamore, and people even don't don't learn about that. Comparing to other major historical atrocities, we learn that in their native language, people don't learn about Irish. Some Irish people they think it's not good. It's for solidarity right now to raise those old memories, and some are don't. Just、um, I will quote Billy Bragg's "The International." The lyric goes as, "Freedom is barely privilege extended." Unless it's shared by one and all, so people have to know. Like, if you go back in the past, you will not be that compradors or white sellers living the wealthy life, exploiting your brethren, but only that one die in sweat factory. Yeah, no. I mean, if you go back in history, the vast majority of us would have been either peasant farmers, or the vast majority of us would be indentured servants. If we're talking about feudal Europe or feudalism anywhere, I mean, so it is kind of an interesting fantasy that people have, even in the U.S. Of like, you know, if, if back in the day I would have been a king or a queen, like, no, you wouldn't be. That's not. <laughs> that's not who you're the descendants of. That's not real. And I, I think to mention Ireland is, is really interesting because we do learn in the U.S. about the Irish potato famine, but the way we learn about it is. Is very much so that the Irish potato famine was just a a, a fluke accident that happened because of a, of a bug that killed all the potatoes, which is true. Uh, but the the question that's not being asked is why are people in Ireland monoculture developing only potatoes as sustenance, and that has a lot to do with colonialism.、It、has a lot to do with the fact that people are poor in Ireland and they rely on potatoes for sustenance. That's what they rely on because they're poor. And so I think that there's something that's really skipped over that the Irish potato famine should really be talked about in a different context in the U.S., especially when we're taught it. We're we're not taught that the greater context of the colon. Colonization of Ireland, and that it continues today. That Northern Ireland is still a colony、uh, of the British, and what that means. And so, I, when the Queen died, it was really interesting to see that people in Ireland were like cheering. <laughs> I mean, people were like having a time because they have a consciousness; they understand what it means to be colonized. And I think that people in the U.S. are, are getting exposed to some of those ideas because of that. But that really wasn't the way that people initially felt, for sure. And I, I think on another point too,、uh, of just thinking about. The United States history, when when you really start to think about it more, just because when we when we really break it down, I mean, the U.S. ruling class really only cares about its own interests. It doesn't care about the interests of everyday people. And whether that means colonizing an entire country, like what we see going on right now with Puerto Rico with Hurricane Fiona, I mean, it's actually wild that people all across Puerto Rico. Don't have access, really don't have access at all to 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 power still. And since 2017, after Hurricane Maria, there really wasn't any sort of improvement on so many different fronts. All the U.S. did was privatize the power grid. And so there's these protests、uh, against Luma, which is the energy corporation in Puerto Rico, which the U.S. essentially forcibly privatized the whole island, so that way the United States could be able to profit. I mean, the United States. Companies would be able to profit and, and make money off of this. So, I mean, that's the legacy of colonialism in the U.S. That's the history of what the United States does. And so, I, I do think it's kind of an interesting contradiction where the U.S. has been involved in not only so many atrocities on on the, on the face of it. I mean, just literally involved in atrocities. It, it is kind of interesting to me that the U.S. always points the finger elsewhere. And so, yeah, that's definitely something that I've always been thinking about, and something that's on the forefront of the minds, I think, of progressive people here as we start to see things. 
get worse in the United States. I mean, inflation is rising. The conditions for people are getting so much worse. And yet somehow we're still in a situation where the U.S. is giving us propaganda like it's all of our faults, but it's really not. But I could go on forever about the corporate media, I will say. <laughs> Me the same. I can I can do that for four hour days. But the thing is, uh, um, I want to raise why Chinese youth are being uh, influenced by uh, some Western media's because possibly they are not being colonial nostalgic. If we educate them with some basic history, but they first they don't have that history knowledge. The second, possibly they are not actually in Mary. Fascinated with Western stories or so-called Western democratic system that much, but more they're being infiltrated by this、uh, preset mindset that the Western is good, the Western is more civilized, and Western is what we will be、mm. ubiquitously, that ultimately. So the fourth is when we learn English in. Possibly, private educational、um, companies. These children always learn pure English articles or just direct foreign textbooks from America or UK. So they do not actually learn about the、uh, national history. They learn more about、um, foreign history. Possibly, they are sharing the same educational system with the US, even they are not actually in the system. They're trying to mimic the system, just like the、um, elite schools in UK. So that's one thing I would like to raise. And the the other part is by doing that, people have this youth mindset that writing like Americans, that thinking like Americans, might, can make your English more fluent. We call that yuga in Chinese, which literally means sense of using language. Sometimes we don't learn about grammar, how you write, but more just like what Americans people talk like, right? Try to mimic that. So when you think about how to explain yourself or say a wording, possibly that is not very advanced in using language, but you're expressing yourself very naturally by mimicking what American people say, think, or express themselves. It's a Quick way to improve your English level, so that is possibly one thing. What is attracting Chinese students like a magnet? Reading the Economist, reading Wapo, reading CNN, especially because CNN can write sorry in very fluent and very touching tone, and say like absolutely fake news. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had a great conversation, but I think we have to leave it here for today, and we'll continue our discussion next episode. Yeah, no, it was definitely great. I mean, there's there's so much more I want to learn. There's so much about. I mean, colonialism as a topic is just such a big topic, and I'm I'm really happy to scratch a little bit of the surface and, and get a sense of what people are feeling. But there is so much more we could talk about. So it was really great chatting with you, and I'm very excited and want to tell everybody to tune in to our next episode of Overlap. It's going to be coming out soon. It's been really great collaborating with you and and with the great folks at Wave Media from Breakthrough News. So we'll see you next time. 